Today we're talking about the new and improved Kodak H35N. I've been using its predecessor and have loved it. But with Kodak's release of this new and updated version, I wanted to compare these side by side, see what's new, and the most important question to answer here, is it worth the upgrade? Hello and welcome to my channel. For those of you who are new, so what is new about the H35 N. Let's start by physically comparing these cameras side by side. On the front of the camera, and probably one of the biggest improvements, is now a glass lens, as opposed to the plastic lens that can be found on the H35. The H35N also has this, what seems to be enamel plate in front, but this doesn't really do much other than cosmetics. And on the front of the camera, you'll also find this brand new addition. Flipping this switch will add a star filter, and we'll get into that later. And you'll also find this dial, which can be turned to turn on the flash. So I need to mention a unique quirk about half frame 35 millimeter cameras. Since it's a half frame, it means that it's taking two separate vertical pictures in the same amount of real estate on film that would normally be one horizontal picture. This is an amazing feature as it doubles the amount of pictures that you're able to take per roll. But the unique quirk that I'm mentioning here is now the vertical and horizontal are flipped. And a very simple quality of life change to this camera is now the viewfinder has been flipped to match that same vertical orientation. Even though that's not a life-changing upgrade, it's very nice to see that subtle inclusion. I just don't know why the back doesn't match it too. But maybe that's just me being picky. On the top of the camera is the same shutter button, but now we have this insert for a cable release, which allows you to shoot in bulb mode. And for those of you who don't know what that is, by using a cable release, you're able to expose your film for as long as you'd like. Perfect for long exposure photography or even multiple exposures, but we'll also get into that later. On the bottom of the camera, it now has a tripod socket. And just like we mentioned, with wanting to do long exposures, it's very important and crucial to keep the camera still. And so, of course, now we have this tripod socket, which allows us to do that. Although I will say that this tripod socket does not feel terribly strong, so I would avoid tightening it too much so that you don't strip the threading. The insides of the camera are completely identical, except this piece now has a spring mechanism which is just a little bit nicer to use. So let's get into these features and talk about what makes them different and potentially better than the H35. The largest and most obvious improvement would be replacing the plastic lens of the H35 with a now glass lens on the H35N. Of course, you're going to get higher quality and sharper image through glass versus plastic, and this in theory should be the biggest improvement across the board. But to be completely honest, the lens on the camera still doesn't necessarily scream high quality and sharpness. Now, of course, this is is just a cheap point-and-shoot camera, so we can't really nitpick too much here. However, maybe not as huge of a jump in quality as you might expect. The next feature we're talking about is the bulb mode, and honestly, I think this is actually a bigger headline than the lens. So, with bulb mode being the star of the show, what exactly is it that we're getting here? By inserting a cable release into the top, which is not included with the camera in case you were wondering, but don't worry, there's plenty of cheap ones out there, you're able to expose your film for as long as you'd like, which allows you to do some really fun and creative things. With long exposure photography, you can do nighttime shots, light trails, smoothing out water, introducing motion blur intentionally. Introducing this bulb mode to this camera, in my opinion, truly brings out more creativity in this camera than in the H35. But here's one very important thing to keep in mind. By inserting a cable release, and triggering the shutter, it will actually override the lock that usually keeps this camera from double exposing. I haven't advanced once and I can still trigger the shutter as many times as I want. Now, Kodak actually lists this as a feature. So now technically you could do multiple exposures on one frame, which also could be explored as a whole route of creativity within that realm, but it's very easy to forget about this and you might end up with frames like this one, where I was just testing to see if the shutter would work and accidentally ruin this shot. So the important tip to remember is if you're using a cable release, you have to advance to the next frame. It's a small thing to mention, but could be a very easy mistake that might ruin some shots. So I figured I'd mention that here. The next feature that I'll be mentioning is the star filter, which can be triggered by pulling this lever up 
and you can visibly see the filter sliding into place. On this filter, you can see horizontal and vertical etch marks going across the filter. And having this filter on will cause all bright lights to have a star. And uh, I lovingly call this the astigmatism filter <laughs> because that's what life usually looks like. I think it's a fun inclusion, but it does feel a little gimmicky if I'm being honest. And the effect is quite strong. In fact, overwhelmingly strong, depending on the situation. And because of its unpredictability, I don't see this being the most used feature on this camera. So let's go back and revisit the image quality. Even though this lens is objectively sharper than its predecessor, I don't feel like it's quite as big of a jump forward in quality that I would have expected from moving from plastic to glass. So if quality were the only thing that you were looking for, it may not make as big of a difference as you're hoping. And for the next comparison between these two cameras, and very interestingly, is price. Now, in my past videos talking about this camera, on Kodak's website, I see it retailing for $49.99, but I've been able to find them for about $40. The H35N retails for $65. So yeah, roughly a 50% bump in price from $40 to $65 might be a harder sell for some people. So price may not be the best determining factor for which camera to buy. And to me, this is where it sits in a very awkward pricing range. Because with a little bit more money, you could just get a fully mechanical SLR film camera, rather than using this simple point and shoot that has pretty limited settings. So with everything that's been said, is the H35N worth the upgrade? I think with either option, they are both wonderful and great cameras. They'll both fit perfectly in that everyday camera that's with you all the time for vibey pictures with your friends or when you're hanging out. And both of them will objectively be better than a disposable camera, even in price alone. You're saving so much money by shooting on a half frame and not losing that much quality at all. They will permanently replace ever buying a disposable camera again. And don't you worry, I made a very in-depth comparison showing the H35 versus disposable cameras. So again, both cameras will give you vibey pictures with pretty minimal effort. So the predecessor, the H35, may be more suited for someone who's 0% interested in learning about photography and also wants to save a couple bucks too. If you're able to find it for that $40 price, that sweetens the deal even more. The H35N will still be for those people who want fun, vibey pictures, but also have an interest in photography and want to explore some of the creative options that the camera has to offer. Sure, the pictures are objectively a little bit sharper, but I think where someone will have the most fun with this camera is the bulb mode, like I mentioned. Being able to take nighttime pictures, do light trails, all that kind of stuff, maybe even the star filter if you're into that, those are some of the more fun and creative features that this camera has to offer that the H35 simply just doesn't have. So, my final thoughts. I think both of these cameras are amazing, but for me personally, I would say that the H35N is worth the upgrade. If you liked this video or found it helpful, please like the video, it actually makes a huge difference. And if you made it this far, please consider subscribing for more content about cameras and film and just anything creative. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.